Welcome to Dialogues for Change. Life is not a void to be filled. It is a plenitude to be discovered. Today, I would like to share with you some thought-provoking insights by Wolfgang Sachs, taken from his book Planet Dialectics. I would more specifically like to share some of his thoughts on the archaeology of the development concept. We speak a lot now about sustainable development, about the development which would take into consideration the social, environmental factors, maybe even cultural aspects also. But sometimes we do not realize how much we are still embedded in the framework of development as the implicit horizon of all our actions. So here is what Wolfgang Sachs says about the archaeology of the development idea. Ruined buildings hide the secrets under piles of earth and rubble. Archaeologists, shovels in hand, work through layer upon layer to reveal underpinnings and thus discover the origins of a dilapidated monument. But ideas can also turn out to be ruins, with their foundations covered by years or even centuries of sand. I believe that the idea of development stands today like a ruin in the intellectual landscape, its shadows obscuring our vision. It is high time we tackled the archaeology of this towering conceit that we uncovered its foundations to see it for what it is, the outdated monument to an immodest era. A world power in search of a mission. Wind and snow stormed over Pennsylvania Avenue on 20th January 1949, when, in his inauguration speech before Congress, US President Harry Truman defined the largest part of the world as underdeveloped areas. There it was. Suddenly a permanent feature of the landscape, a pivotal concept that crammed the immeasurable diversity of the globe south into a single category, underdeveloped. For the first time, the new worldview was, was announced. All the peoples of the earth were to move along the same track and aspire to only one goal, development. And the road to follow lay clearly before the president's eyes. Greater production is the key to prosperity and peace. After all, was it not the USA that had already come closest to this utopia? According to that yardstick, nations fall into place as stragglers or lead runners, and the United States is preeminent among nations in the development of industrial and scientific techniques. Clothing self-interest in generosity, Truman outlined a program of technical assistance designed to relieve the sufferings of this people through industrial activities and a higher standard of living. Looking back after 40 years, we recognize Truman's speech as the starting gun in the race for the South to catch up with the North. But we also see that the field of runners has been dispersed, as some competitors have fallen by the wayside and others have begun to suspect that they are running in the wrong direction. The idea of defining the world as an economic arena originated in Truman's time. It would have been completely alien to colonialism. True. Colonial powers saw themselves as participating in an economic race with their overseas territories a source of raw materials. But it was only after the Second World War that these territories had to stand on their own and compete in a global economic arena. For Britain and France during the colonial period, dominion over their colonies was first of all a cultural obligation that stemmed from their vocation to a civilizing mission. British imperial administrator Lord Lugard had formulated the doctrine of the double mandate, economic profit, of course, but above all the responsibility to elevate the colored races to a higher level of civilization. The colonialists came as masters to rule over the natives. They did not come as planners to start the spiral of supply and demand. Development as imperative. According to Truman's vision, the two commandments of the double mandate converge under the imperative of economic development. A change in worldview had thus taken place, 
allowing the concept of development to rise to a standard of universal rule. In the British Development Act of 1929, still influenced by colonial frameworks, development applied only to the first duty of the double mandate, the economic exploitation of resources such as land, minerals and wood products. The second duty was defined as progress or welfare. At this time it was thought that only resources, not people or societies, could be developed. It was in the corridors of the State Department during the Second World War that cultural progress was absorbed by economic mobilization and development was enthroned as the crowning concept. A new worldview had found its succinct definition. The degree of civilization in a country could be measured by the level of its production. There was no longer any reason to limit the domain of development to resources only. From now on, people and whole societies could, or even should, be seen as the objects of development. Truman's imperative to development that societies of the third world were no longer seen as diverse and incomparable possibilities of human living arrangements, but were rather placed on a single progressive track. Judged more or less advanced according to the criteria of the Western industrial nations. Such a reinterpretation of global history was not only politically flattering, but also unavoidable, since underdevelopment can be recognized only looking back from a state of maturity. Development without predominance is like a race without direction, so the, per so the pervasive power and influence of the West was logically included in the pro proclamation of development. It is no coincidence that the preamble of the United Nations Charter, we, the people of the United Nations, echoes the Constitution of the USA, we, the people of the United States. Development meant nothing less than projecting the American model of society onto the rest of the world. Truman really needed such a reconceptualization of the world. The old colonial world had fallen apart. The United States, the strongest nation to emerge from the war, was obliged to act as the new world power. For this, it needed a vision of a new global order. The concept of development provided the answer because it presented the world as a collection of homogeneous entities held together not through the political dominion of colonial times, but through economic interdependence. interdependence. It meant that the independence process of young countries could be allowed to proceed because they automatically fell under the wing of the USA anyway when they proclaimed themselves to be subjects of economic development. Development was the conceptual vehicle that allowed the USA to behave as herald of national self-determination while at the same time founding a new type of worldwide domination, an anti-colonial imperialism. These are very thought-provoking thoughts, and it's worth pondering them and deepening them a bit. Not to say that, in my view, we should completely do away with the idea of development, but that we should maybe put it into context and be careful not to see it as the all-embracing myth or horizon into, in which we act. I hope that these thoughts inspired you on this Friday, 15th of June, 2012. Thank you.